the strength of the Soviet Air Force has often been associated with the MiGs, internationally famous fighter planes. During the Cold War years, the MiG fighters were the primary adversaries for three generations of Western aircraft. In numerous regional conflicts, the MiGs repeatedly demonstrated their awesome combat power. While every Western pilot learned to recognize MiGs in the air, little has been known about the history of these planes and the people who created them. flights to Europe, China and the United States. To meet the demand for more highly qualified aviation engineers, the Bolshevik purpose biplanes. Among them the famous Po-2, a trainer converted to a night bomber during World War II. In the late 1930s, Polikarpov's I-15 biplane and I-16 monoplane were produced by the thousands, making his bureau an unchallenged leader in fighter design. When Mikoyan came to the Bureau, he helped update the I-16 
and designed the I-153 biplane with retractable landing gear. Polikarpov noticed the talented young engineer and put him in charge of all the Bureau's work on the production models. Polikarpov believed that highly maneuverable but relatively slow biplanes complemented high-speed monoplanes in air combat. Fighting during the Spanish Civil War disproved this idea. Over Madrid, the new Nazi Messerschmitt BF-109E bested both the I-16s and the I-15s, making use of its superiority in speed. Polikarpov's fighters had to be replaced with faster monoplanes that could match the 109. Stalin sanctioned the formation of new bureaus headed by promising young designers able to create a new generation fighter. Meanwhile, Artyom Mikoyan gathered a team of designers and engineers in the Polikarpov Bureau to realize his concepts for a superplane. One of these designers, Mikhail Gorevich, would become Mikoyan's closest friend and associate. Born in 1892, Gurevich graduated from the Institute of Technology in Kharkov. He acquired a vast background in design. In the autumn of 1939, Mikoyan's team proposed a project for a fighter named the I-200. Their aircraft would use an engine created by Alexander Mikulin. The AM-35 engine was originally designed for long-range bombers and was famous for its unique characteristics at high altitudes. With Anastas Mikoyan's support, the I-200 project was approved by the party leadership. A bureau was created to build the new plane with Artyom Mikoyan as its director. A war with Germany seemed imminent. Wehrmacht troops marched through Europe. Its cities collapsed under Luftwaffe bombs. The Soviet government demanded the Bureau immediately complete the new aircraft. Working day and night, Mikoyan's team finished the design and built the plane in less than three months. In April 1940, the I-200 was first flown by test pilot Arkady Yakatov. The test flight showed that this was the fastest Soviet plane ever made. Its speed exceeded 400 miles per hour. The new fighter was put into production as the MiG-1, named after its creators, Mikoyan and Gurevich. While the MiG-1 was still in testing, Mikoyan improved the design. The modified plane, designated the MiG-3, was given leading edge flaps for greater maneuverability and an additional fuel tank. Both aircraft were put into service at the end of 1940, but only 200 of the MiG-1s were ever made. The more numerous MiG-3 had a service ceiling of almost 40,000 feet, a range of 780 miles, and was armed with one 12.7 millimeter machine gun and two smaller ones. Although the production of Mikoyan's planes increased rapidly throughout 1941, by the time of Russia's entry into the war, the obsolete Polikarpov planes still greatly outnumbered the MiGs. The I-16s would become an easy prey for the experienced Goering aces.
The German invasion began on June the 22nd with massive Luftwaffe bombing raids. Airfields were primary targets. Airstrips and ground installations were wrecked. Among the hundreds of Soviet planes destroyed on the ground were many brand new MiGs never flown in combat. The air war proved that the Air Force pilots had not yet adequately mastered the MiGs. The fighters required new flying skills and greater accuracy from airmen accustomed to the simpler and slower Polykarpov planes. Yet unquestionably, aces could fight and win in their MiGs. Two special MiG-3 regiments formed exclusively from test pilots of the Air Force Research Institute were famous for their record kills. The, the regiments were the creation of test pilot Stepan Suprun, who commanded one of them personally. Brilliant ace Piotr Stefanovsky headed the other. In late June 1941, these formations flew to the front. Suprun was shot down and killed after four days of combat. He was succeeded by his aide, Konstantin Kokinaki. For test pilots with their extraordinary flying ability, the 109s were easy targets, especially at medium and high altitudes. But Soviet airmen noticed the MiG-3's serious liabilities. It had weaker firepower than the 109 and was slower at low altitudes. Luftwaffe pilots began to engage the MiGs in low altitude combat where they held a crucial advantage. Squadrons of MiG-3s were assigned to defend major Soviet cities against the incessant Nazi bombing raids. The MiG pilots found their planes were much more effective against bombers than against the 109s. The MiG's high service ceiling and rate of climb were decisive in night interceptor missions. The Mikoyan planes were responsible for more than half of the Luftwaffe bombers shot down over Moscow and Leningrad. One of the best Soviet aces, Alexander Pokrishkin, made his first kill in a MiG-3. In autumn 1941, as the Germans approached Moscow, the Mikoyan factory was relocated to Koibyshev on the Volga. Production was resumed, only to be halted in December, when Stalin ordered the engine manufacturing plant for the MiG-3s to convert to produce engines for his favorite aircraft, the Il-2 ground attack plane. Three thousand two hundred MiGs had been produced by that time. Simple to repair and maintain, some of them remained in service until 1943, flying in combat in Moldova, the Kuban, and the Crimea. In March 1942, the Mikoyan Bureau was given several old industrial buildings in Moscow. The construction of the new facilities began in April. Despite the difficulties caused by the two relocations, Mikoyan and his engineers continued their work on new and original aircraft. In 1941, they built the DIS-200, a twin-engine escort fighter with a range of more than 1,700 miles. It was successfully tested, but remained experimental. Although MiG-3 production was halted, Mikoyan continued to improve the fighter. At first, he equipped the plane with the respected Shvetsov Asha-82 air-cooled engine. This propulsion unit powered the Lavochkin La-5 fighter, triumphant over Stalingrad. Mikoyan's craft, with the Shvetsov engine, the I-211, was built in 1943. Although it performed well, the Lavochkin fighter with the same engine was already in service. Only 10 I-211 saw combat. A succession of high-altitude interceptors followed. 
Improved engines allowed these planes to reach speeds of 450 miles per hour and service ceilings of up to 48,000 feet. They had pressurized cockpits, bladder fuel tanks, and four cannon armament. Although these interceptors were never manufactured for general service, their new features were incorporated on post-war jet fighters. Piston engines gradually lost their appeal, as aircraft designers realized that the propeller posed an insurmountable obstacle, prohibiting piston-engined fighters from flying faster than 550 miles per hour. Although not yet perfected, the jet engine had a far greater potential. Mikoyan and Gurevich decided to test the jet engine in flight. In March of 1945, their I-250 fighter, powered by a combination of piston engine and turbojet, reached 515 miles per hour. Higher speeds needed new aerodynamic configurations. In 1945, the Mikoyan Bureau built the MiG-8, a light wooden plane. Test pilot Alexei Grinchik was the first to fly this unusual craft, incorporating four radical innovations. A swept wing, a pusher prop, canard control surfaces, and landing gear with a nose wheel. The swept wing, first tested on this aircraft, was widely used on later jets. The only MiG-8 built was used as a mail plane. Meanwhile, the Mikoyan Bureau continued to experiment with new propulsion units. In 1946, the Bureau built the I-270 experimental interceptor, powered by a liquid propellant jet engine. The plane had an extremely high service ceiling and rate of climb, but only a five-minute supply of fuel. After two prototypes crashed on landing, the program was halted. The more fuel-efficient turbojets would power the planes of the future. By the end of the war, designer Akhip Lyulka had built the first Soviet turbojet engines, yet they were not reliable enough to be tested in flight. Instead, Mikoyan and his designers had to use BMW engines captured from the Germans. One engine alone could not produce enough thrust, so the initial plan envisioned the use of two, mounted under the wing. Mikoyan opposed this drag-increasing configuration and suggested that the two BMWs should be placed inside the plane's body. Fitting the engines into the fuselage was a difficult task for the designers, but they were rewarded by the truly unique performance of their creation. The new turbojet fighter, designated the I-300, first took off in April 1946, piloted by Alexei Grinchik. The flight was successful, and Grinchik continued the testing. In July 1946, during its 20th flight, and while the plane was being demonstrated to the military, it suddenly overturned, dived, and crashed. The pilot was killed. Excessive vibration had caused aileron flutter, resulting in the catastrophe. The engineers reduced the vibration, and tests on another I-300 started a month later. Test pilot Mark Galai was given the assignment of reaching the maximum possible speed. His plane's elevators jammed during the flight, but he managed to land the almost uncontrollable aircraft. Problems with the tailplanes had caused the accident. After these were corrected, the plane became much safer. The I-300 became the first Soviet production turbojet fighter under the MiG-9 designation. Powered by two modified RD-20 engines, Based on the BMWs, the MiG-9 demonstrated at the Tushino Air Show in October 1946 could reach a speed of nearly 570 miles per hour and a service ceiling of 45,000 feet. It performed better than any other Soviet turbojet fighter. For his design, 
Mikoyan received the state prize, the highest government award given for significant technological achievements. Several versions of the MiG-9 were created. In 1946, the MiG-9 Uti, a two-seat trainer, was built. One of the first Soviet ejection seats, designed by the Mikoyan Bureau, was tested using this plane. A year later, the seat became standard on the MiG-9M. This fighter, with its two enhanced performance turbojets, could exceed 600 miles per hour. Another MiG-9 became a flying lab for testing a guidance system later used on the KS-1, the first Soviet winged missile. Meanwhile, the Bureau continued a series of experiments with a swept wing design, which drastically reduced drag at transonic speeds. The MiG-15 fighter was the first plane to combine the swept wing and the jet engine. Problems in the hydraulic control system caused landing gear troubles, which plagued test flights in 1947. The problems were solved, and by the end of the year, the fighter was put into production. It became one of the world's most famous combat aircraft in service in the Soviet Union and other countries of the Eastern Bloc for a decade. The MiG-15s were originally powered by the Neen turbojet engines, licensed from Rolls-Royce, manufactured in Russia. They were later replaced by the Soviet Klimov RD-45s. This fighter flew at a maximum speed of more than 650 miles per hour and had a service ceiling of nearly 50,000 feet. It was equipped with a pressurized cabin and an ejection seat. The MiG-15 had the largest production run among Soviet planes of the 50s and was widely exported. China received hundreds of these fighters as part of an extensive Soviet military aid program. Both Chinese and Russian pilots flew MiG-15s in Korean war combat, where they confronted the F-86 Sabre, the best American fighter of the early 1950s. The MiG was superior in its climb rate and firepower, while the heavier, slower Sabre enjoyed the advantage of radar. Each side exaggerated its kill rates, yet both sides acknowledged that the MiG and the Sabre were worthy opponents. The tactical advantage of radar was made obvious in Korea. Mikoyan was commissioned by the Air Force to create a radar-equipped version of the MiG-15. During 1949-50, a succession of these planes with a variety of radars and performance-enhanced engines was built and tested under the common MiG-15 BIS designation. To increase the MiG-15's range, designers equipped a version with a refueling probe, allowing the fighter to receive additional fuel in the air from Tupolev Tu-4 tankers. As another range-increasing attempt, the MiG was fitted with external fuel tanks mounted on the wing. Due to the MiG-15's widespread use, the Air Force needed a trainer version of the aircraft. In 1949, the twin-seat MiG-15 Uti was created. It was also used for testing the SK rescue system, which protected a pilot ejecting at high speeds by using the cockpit canopy. Simultaneously with the improvements of the MiG-15, the Mikoyan Bureau built the I-320, a two-seat, heavy, all-weather interceptor equipped with radar. This plane, with two vertically stacked engines, was successfully tested, but a faster aircraft, the Yakovlev Yak-25, 
was chosen for manufacture. In the late 1940s, aviators considered speed the most critical element in air combat, and designers' primary objectives were to create a plane that could break the sound barrier. In 1949, Mikoyans Jans developed a new fighter based on the MiG-15. It was put into production as the MiG-17. Its wing, thinner than that of its predecessor, also had a 10 degree greater sweep back. This configuration, combined with the powerful Klimov VK-1 turbojet, produced higher speed. The new MiG almost reached the sound barrier in horizontal flight. The MiG-17 was fitted with external fuel tanks mounted under the wing. Traditionally, Mikoyan used heavy cannon armament on his jets. The 17 received three cannons, one 37mm and two 20mm, located under the air intake. This easily maintainable and unpretentious fighter was exported to the Eastern Bloc and Third World countries. It performed particularly well during the Middle East conflict of 1956, demonstrating a superiority in speed and firepower over the French Dassault Mystère four fighters. After the new Klimov VK-1F afterburning turbojet was installed on the MiG, the plane became even faster than its prototype. Meanwhile, the Bureau made its first winged missile the KS-1. The missile's airframe was a smaller version of the MiG-17s. The mass-produced KS-1, armed with a nuclear warhead and controlled by an automatic guidance system, became standard armament for the Tupolev Tu-16 carrier and a prototype for an entire family of winged and cruise missiles designed by Mikoyan's bureau. In the early 1950s, the Bureau began to develop a supersonic fighter. Its first attempt, the M-Craft, powered by a single Yulka Al-7 engine, was far from perfect. Only the extraordinary flying skills of test pilot Grigory Sedov saved the plane from crashing when its engine died at a height of 3,000 feet above the ground. Shortly afterwards, the fighter acquired a new aerodynamic shape and was equipped with two Mikulin RD-9B afterburning turbojets. The modified plane first flew in May of 1952 and was put into production in 1954 as the MiG-19. With its 55 degree wing sweep back angle, the plane easily mastered supersonic speeds exceeding 600 miles per hour. This speed required new principles of flight control. Elevators, no longer effective, were replaced with all moving tailplanes. The entire control system was redesigned to facilitate the pilot's job. In 1955, the advanced radar-equipped MiG-19P interceptor replaced the original radar-less version. This craft had two cannons, one less than its prototype, but carried radically new air-to-air -air weapons. It was the first missile-armed MiG. An air defense interceptor has only minutes to take off and climb to altitudes of 50 to 60,000 feet to reach and destroy its target. Mikoyan's bureau tried to minimize the interceptor's reaction time with several experimental models based on the MiG-19. One of them, the SM-30, tested by Grigory Shyanov in 1956, did not require a takeoff run. Within seconds, this plane with its solid fuel rocket booster could take off from a mobile platform. A liquid propellant rocket booster was used on the SM-50, which could reach a 65,000 feet altitude in eight minutes. 
the Mikoyan Bureau gradually became the leader in Soviet fighter design. As government funding increased, Mikoyan expanded his research and development. The Bureau became a large-scale enterprise with modern equipment and well-trained personnel. In the second half of the 1950s, its designers confronted new problems as their aircraft came closer to Mach 2. The heat barrier was a seemingly unsurmountable obstacle. At Mach 2, powerful temperature stresses tore the plane's airframe apart. Radically new materials and aerodynamic shapes were necessary for flight at twice the speed of sound. On the experimental E-5 fighter, designed in 1956, the delta wing was tested. The plane reached 1,250 miles per hour in horizontal flight and was developed further. The Bureau paid a high price for its Mach 2 breakthrough. Mikoyan's chief pilot, Vladimir Nefyodov, died in an E-5 crash, trying to land the plane after its engine had failed. Each fatal crash was a terrible blow to Artyom Mikoyan. Test pilots were not only skilled flyers with invaluable technical knowledge, but also the chief designer's personal friends. After Nefyodov's death, Georgi Mosolov continued tests on the new fighter together with Konstantin Kokinaki. Kokinaki was one of Mikoyan's most experienced flyers, a World War II ace who had commanded a MiG-3 regiment. He worked for the Bureau during the 1950s, testing the MiG-17 and the MiG-19. In 1958, the Delta Wing fighter MiG-21F, based on the E-5, was put into production. It was designed for close air combat, could fly at Mach 2 and reach 60,000 feet altitudes. The plane could also be used for ground attack missions. It was armed with two fuselage-mounted 30mm cannons, bombs and rockets on an external carriage. In 1959, the plane was adapted to use the K-13 air-to-air missiles. In the early 1960s, this version, the MiG-21 F-13, was put into service in Eastern Europe, Finland and India. A version of the MiG-21F designated the E-66, became a record-breaking plane. In 1959, Georgi Masalov flew his E-66 at 1,490 miles per hour, breaking the record then held by the Lockheed Starfighter. Another Starfighter record was broken in 1961, when Masalov reached a zoom altitude of 110,000 feet. The Delta Wing Mikoyan fighter was repeatedly modified. The MiG-21F's trainer version, the MiG-21U, designed in 1961, is still in service at Air Force schools. The experimental E-8 fighter, built in 1962, had canard surfaces and a belly-mounted air intake. Another experimental plane was designed by Mikoyan to help his friend, Andrei Tupolev in the research for a supersonic airliner. This tailless craft, the MiG-21I, was used to test a new Gothic wing shape for the Tupolev Tu-144, which first flew in 1968. Further development of the MiG-21 led to the installation of onboard radar. The MiG-21PF a multi-purpose fighter built in 1960 had radar mounted inside the cone-shaped intake center body and could search and track aerial targets in any weather conditions, day or night. This new MiG also had a more powerful engine, a boundary layer control system improving landing performance and an advanced ejection seat. In 1966, MiG-21 PFs confronted McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantoms in Vietnam. The MiG's better maneuverability and the cockpit view cancelled out the Phantom's superior firepower in air combat. The 
The MiG performed so well in Vietnam that Mikoyan's bureau continued to develop and update the plane for two decades. Three generations of turbojets and flight control and navigation equipment replaced one another on the Mikoyan fighter. Since 1958, 17 versions of the MiG-21 have been mass-produced in the USSR, India, Czechoslovakia and China. These planes have served in the air forces of more than 30 countries. The most recent version, the MiG-21 BIS, was manufactured until 1986. This fighter was completely different from earlier 21s. Its powerful R25-300 after-burning turbojet allowed it to fly at Mach 2.05 and reach a service ceiling of 58,000 feet. This craft was equipped with an advanced Doppler radar and an improved ejection seat that enabled its pilot to abandon the plane at ground level. The MiG-21 BIS carried a 23mm cannon and short-range air-to-air missiles on four underwing hardpoints. Although the 21s were effective in dogfights, they were inadequate for long-range combat. In the late 1950s, Soviet air defense needed radically new planes to intercept strategic bombers and intercontinental cruise missiles. These aircraft needed Mach 3 capability and the capacity to carry long-range missiles. Mikoyan searched for novel solutions to come closer to Mach 3. His E-50, built in 1957, fitted with both a turbojet and a liquid propellant rocket motor, exceeded 1,500 miles per hour. Testing several heavy planes that followed the E-50, the Bureau gained a base of experience enabling it to create a radically new interceptor. The E-155 first flew in March 1964. It had a tapered wing, lateral intakes, and a twin-finned tail. This heavy, two-engined plane was designed to fly at Mach 2.83. The high speeds required new materials and technology. The E-155's airframe was made of stainless steel and titanium alloys. The overall length of its welded seams equaled the distance from the Earth to the Moon. The extremely complicated series of tests which this type of aircraft required continued for six years. In 1970, this plane entered service as the MiG-25. One primary model was the MiG-25R, a strategic recce plane equipped for both photo and laser reconnaissance and radar and signals intelligence. Another mass-produced version, the MiG-25P, was a radar-equipped interceptor with a standard armament of four long-range R-40 missiles. MiG-25s, designated the E-133 and the E-266, set 29 world records for speed, altitude and climb rate. Some of them still hold. One of the most impressive was set in 1975, when Alexander Fedotov, Mikoyan's chief pilot, climbed 100,000 feet in 4 minutes, 12 seconds. For many years, everything concerning the MiG-25's construction, equipment and maintenance was conducted in strict secrecy. But ironically, this plane became the first MiG to fall in the hands of the NATO military. In September 1976, a top-secret MiG-25 was flown to Japan by a defecting pilot. Although it was returned to the Soviet Union, US Air Force experts had enough time to study the interceptor in detail. The Soviets were forced to further upgrade the MiG. A new version, built in 1977, carried advanced missiles and was equipped with an infrared sensor to detect low-flying targets. This plane remained in service until the early 90s. 
At the same time as the 25 was being upgraded, the Bureau designed a space re-entry vehicle. This small craft, known as the Spiral, was tested in the mid-70s, but never launched into space. Since the mid-1960s, Mikoyan had been working on a new combat fighter to replace the MiG-21. His creation had a variable geometry wing. This concept was the designer's attempt to incorporate the advantages of a straight wing, both during takeoff and landing and at subsonic speeds, with the benefits of a swept wing in supersonic flight. The prototype made its maiden flight in April 1967. Three months later, it was displayed to the public at the Damadedeva Aviation Festival as the MiG-23. The aircraft performed new maneuvers made possible by the variable geometry wing able to change its sweep back angle from 16 to 72 degrees. Another version of the fighter, the MiG-23 PD, was also displayed. It had a delta wing and additional lift engines which shortened takeoff and landing runs, allowing the plane to operate from a 550-foot airstrip. This plane remained experimental, while the variable geometry fighter was put into production, entering service in 1969. The MiG-23 became the first light MiG to carry heavyweight medium-range missiles, but like its predecessors, it still could operate from low-class airfields. It was one of the Soviet Union's primary military aircraft, produced in even greater numbers than the MiG-21. Its most widespread fighter version is the MiG-23 ML. This 33,000-pound radar-equipped aircraft can reach 1,500 miles per hour. Its standard armament includes two medium-range R-23 missiles, two short-range R-60 missiles, and a 23-millimeter cannon mounted in the fuselage. Advanced cabin instrumentation facilitates weapon targeting. The MiG-23, carrying bombs and rockets, was used for ground attack, but the first years of its service showed its ineffectiveness in this role. In 1972, to meet the need for a better ground attack plane, the Bureau created the MiG-27, a radically new aircraft based on the MiG-23. In the MiG-27, radar was replaced with optical and laser equipment optimized for ground target detection, while its construction was reinforced to increase survivability under heavy anti-aircraft fire. The plane can carry an 8,800-pound payload, including bombs, rockets, and air-to-surface missiles. It also employs a fuselage-mounted six-barrel 30-millimeter cannon. The MiG-25 and the MiG-23 were Artyom Mikoyan's last aircraft. This talented designer personally supervised work on more than a hundred planes created by his bureau. Mikoyan was seriously ill during the last years of his life. In 1970, he died of a heart attack during a surgical operation. After Mikoyan died, his apprentice, Rostislav Belyakov, headed the bureau. In October 1977, Alexander Fedotov became the first pilot to fly a new MiG, the MiG-29, a fourth-generation multi-purpose fighter.
this was the last craft Fedotov would finish for the Bureau. In 1984, the legendary ace died while testing the MiG-31 interceptor. He sacrificed his life trying until the last moment to save his falling plane. The Bureau's test pilot flight school was named in Fedotov's honor. After successful testing, in 1982, the MiG-29 was put into production. This fighter has blended configuration with well-developed leading edge root extensions. Composite materials are widely used in its construction. The MiG is powered by two fuel-efficient RD-33 turbofans located in belly-mounted nacelles. These engines produce a thrust-to-weight ratio exceeding one. During the 1980s, the MiG-29 became the primary fighter of the Soviet Air Force. This aircraft surpasses all its predecessors in maneuverability. It has a tight turning radius, a 26 degrees per second turning rate, and is capable of flying at low speeds with a large angle of attack. The MiG-29 can reach 1,500 miles per hour, has a 60,000 feet service ceiling, and a 1,200 feet per second rate of climb. This craft has fuselage-mounted 30mm cannon and, in its primary fighter version, can carry six air-to-air -air missiles. As standard, the MiG-6 underwing hardpoints mount two middle-range R-27s or R-60s and four heat-seeking short-range R-73s. Armed with rockets and bombs, the MiG-29 can also be used for ground attack. This fighter is now in service in Algeria, Poland, Germany, Syria, India and Iraq. After the German reunification, Luftwaffe also received several dozen MiGs, formerly in the possession of the East German Air Force. German pilots now fly aircraft they were previously supposed to fight against. The MiG-29 shown here are flown by a professional piloting squadron known as the Strigi, Swifts. Its airmen are considered among the best aerobatics masters in the world. The MiG-29 became a basis for the two-seat MiG-29UB trainer and the carrier-based MiG-29K fighter, which employs additional canard surfaces facilitating flight control. This plane was designed for the Admiral Kuznetsov, the first Soviet full-scale aircraft carrier. The 29K, the Bureau's first carrier-based fighter, was tested extensively for five years on a ramp-equipped ground airfield where Mikoyan's pilots mastered new techniques of takeoff and landing. In November 1989, after several trial touchdowns, pilot Toktar Aubakirov performed the first landing on the flight deck of the Admiral Kuznetsov carrier. Then, without using a catapult, he made the first takeoff from the deck ramp. In the summer of 1992, another new generation MiG was first shown to the Russian public at the Moscow Aero Show. This plane, the MiG-31, was built in 1975, based on the MiG-25, and was shrouded in secrecy for 15 years. This ultra-heavy, 100,000-pound interceptor with its two RD-30 F6 turbofans retained the high performance of its prototype. The 31 can accelerate to 1,900 miles per hour 
and climb to 65,000 feet. The plane's advanced equipment makes it dramatically different from the MiG-25. It mounts a powerful phased array radar, allowing it to detect aerial targets at a range of 180 miles. Low flying targets can be tracked by an infrared sensor. The interceptor's fire control system allows to fire at four targets and track ten targets simultaneously. This interceptor, unique in its class, demonstrates the potential of the Mikoyan Bureau. In its 50-year history, the Bureau grew from a small department into one of the largest aviation enterprises in the Soviet Union. More than 180 planes were designed, built and tested by the Bureau. Its MiG fighters became synonymous with high performance and reliability, a bridge to the 21st century for Russian aviation.